Thanks, Rod, for the introduction. Uh, I'll try to make up a little bit of time. I'm not mic'd up, so I'm not going to do the TED Talk thing, and I prefer to stand in one spot so it works even, even better uh, for me. But uh, we work in a very multidisciplinary team. We've got... Uh, it's very rare that I get to interact with physicists, chemists, pharmacists, uh, engineers. Uh, this is a great field to be in, and whichever member you are of the team... Uh, you get this close interaction. And I don't think that happens in many areas of the world, really, uh, that we have a team in a single department that has uh, so many skills in different areas, and we all come together to try to do something to improve the outcome uh, of a person. Uh, so when I think about the future of PET, it involves advances in all these different areas, and I can't possibly uh, cover all of this in 20 or 25 minutes. So I'm perhaps going to focus on the uh, medicine uh, part of it, uh, which involves doctors, nurses, uh, technologists, and just touch on some other aspects that are equally really as important, but I uh, perhaps don't have the time uh, or expertise in those other areas to cover them in detail today. So the reason I came to Peter Mac almost uh, eight years ago was because of, uh, was because of Rod. Uh, he was driving a uh, pet at the time, and uh, I approached him on several occasions to give, him a, to give me a job, and eventually he did. Uh, which was fantastic, and he really uh, foresaw that PET was going to become a mainstream technology where other people uh, did not. Uh, he saw the superior uh, radio tracer sensitivity compared to conventional nuclear medicine, that it gave us higher spatial resolution, fully 3D images. Uh, we could combine it with uh, CT and now MRI. We could do very precise quantification, and uh, because of its speed compared to conventional imaging, Perhaps it was even cheaper, even though the devices uh, cost more. But ultimately, uh, it was driven by this desire to improve uh, patient outcomes. And the other reason I came to Peter Mac uh, at the time was because I was getting a little bored with FDG. I, I was working out in a private pet centre doing uh, FDG imaging all day, and that was uh, already making me a little bit bored. Uh, but on my sabbatical in London, I had been exposed to some gallium dotatate uh, pet images over at UCL, and they were quite uh, extraordinary images. The videos just disappeared there. Uh, this is a India mock trier scan compared to the same scan done on a PET scanner uh, only three days later, and the images were remarkable. And uh, Rod put the first gallium generator in Australia, and it was there at the time when I joined uh, eight years ago, and that was another driver uh, for me to join the team with all the obvious advances that Rod's pointed out. And at the time, there was still no MBS reimbursement for this scan that was cheaper than the conventional scan, which is true to this day. And when we uh, wrote a manuscript summarising the benefits of gallium dotatate, we put it the la as the last line, rapid implementation could be achieved by allowing substitutional funding in the Medicare benefits scheme. Uh, so I'm hopeful that that will uh, hopefully occur sooner rather than later, because without having some of these technologies that we're going to talk about funded, it's difficult to uh, make them uh, mainstream. And when I thought about my last decade of pet experience and I had to think of one standout uh, case, uh, it, it was this case uh, of a 43-year-old patient who was extremely unwell with multiple insufficiency fractures, severe muscle weakness, previously well, now confined to a wheelchair. And after extensive investigation, I was found to have this syndrome called oncogenic osteomalacia, uh, which is due to a small tumour that secretes a hormone uh, that makes the kidneys lose phosphate and causes this syndrome. And this patient, over a three-year period, had every diagnostic test known to man uh, to try to localise this tumour, including two FDG PETs. Uh, you can see the list. Everything was normal. Uh, the patient went overseas for another workup. No cause could be found. And then when we did a gallium dotatate PET scan... Uh, it gave us the answer very quickly, uh, which was this abnormality uh, down here in the foot. And this N equals 1 case, when this was surgically excised, uh, the patient was cured. They were able to rise from their wheelchair as the muscle weakness went away and the bone pain uh, went away. So quite an extraordinary case of a diagnostic modality, uh, which has clearly benefited this patient. And the first time I showed this uh, scan at a talk, which was probably around seven years ago, one of the nuclear medicine technologists came up to me at the end of the talk and said, I think I know someone who's got this tumour who is currently in hospital, and that was case number two, which was this tumour in the thigh, and this patient was also 
uh, cured, and since then we've described a whole uh, series, and a little bit bizarre that this is the order they were discovered in, but they went from toe to, uh, toe to head. And this is a little bit like finding a, ne a needle in a haystack, and it shows the power of PET and how a new imaging modality at the time, the gallium dotatate or gatate PET-CT, could radically improve the lives of patients with this uh, rare condition. So Rod's had a vision that I shared that we could replace really all of general nuclear medicine from SPECT and convert it over to PET-CT because of all the advantages we've talked about. And we use a variety of traces really in, uh, in everyday practice. I think on, on a record Friday a few months ago, 45% of the studies we did in the PET centre were non-FDG. And on that day, I think we had an FET, a fluorocholine, uh, some GAT8 scans and an I124 scan, and that made up sort of half the PET volume of that day. <coughs> uh, so we really use a variety of different traces on a daily basis here at Peter Mac, and that makes it a very rewarding uh, place to work. And over the next five minutes of this talk, I'll show you uh, some examples of, of what we've done. So the gallium dotatake volume has really increased from 2008 onwards, and I'm pleased to see that this is disseminated throughout Australia. I think there are... Uh, over uh, 25 sites around Australia uh, now with gallium generators that are doing uh, dotatate PET scanning. Uh, we, once we had the gallium generator, we wondered what else we could do with it. And being a radiometal, much like technetium 99M, we can label a lot of conventional nuclear medicine traces really very easily with gallium 68. So we commenced doing uh, gallium VQ imaging, gallium EDTA, and more recently, PSMA for prostate cancer. Uh, but also a range of other uh, traces. I think when Henry Wagner did the first VQ scan over 50 years ago, this is a study showing pulmonary emboli, large unmatched defects in the lung, people must have thought he was crazy, that every big hospital in the world would have a nuclear medicine camera where people would breathe in some gas to do ventilation images and then inject a substance to look at perfusion to the lung. This is quite a complicated process and... Uh, that really did disseminate throughout the world. And uh, VQ scanning became a test that was available in almost every hospital around the world. And when we think about doing that test on a PET scanner, which is really a much smaller leap, doing this test uh, just with gallium instead of technetium, people seem to think that we're a bit uh, uh, nutty, a bit crazy. That why would you do a VQ scan uh, on the PET scanner rather than your conventional nuclear medicine scanner? But it's somewhat obvious to us because the image quality is much better and we can do the test in a quarter of the time. So why wouldn't we uh, do a better test that's faster? And we did a series of 10 patients where we did a SPECT VQ and then we injected the uh, galley gas or got the patient to inhale galley gas, injected gallium MAA to do the lung perfusion images and the image quality was indeed significantly better on the PET VQ. Uh, images. The PET scanners are a lot more advanced. We can do respiratory gating very easily. That In this uh, patient, we've done a gated CT and also a gated PET that allows us to align each bin of the scan very accurately. The lungs are a moving structure, so if you don't have respiratory gating, you get a very blurred image. Uh, by uh, fusing gated images together, we get beautiful co-registration. This is a patient with an acute pneumonia uh, this is the perfusion images showing increased perfusion to that segment of pneumonia as the inflammatory cells are uh, being driven to that area. And look at the beautiful, precise co-registration we get with gated images. And the American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine, the highest impact respiratory journal, uh, chose to put this image uh, on their front cover. Uh, this is a patient who had uh, breast cancer with long-standing pleural effusions that we can see on the scan. Uh, and as part of a prospective study where we're doing PET VQ scanning to diagnose pulmonary embolism, had a CTPA, which was looked at by our two best radiologists, who said this is an absolutely normal uh, CTPA study, CT pulmonary angiogram. But the PET VQ study showed multiple unmatched defects. And let's look at this slice in a little bit more detail on the PET scanner, where we can do a high-end CT as well, either 64 or 128 slice CT on many of the CT, on PET CT scanners nowadays. So you can do a CTPA on the PET camera and fuse it very precisely. 
uh, to the functional imaging. And here we can see this large unmatched perfusion defect. And when we go back and look at the CT, we can see a pulmonary artery uh, who is, which is tapered because of the clot. And this was not visualised prospectively. But when we went back to our radiologists and said, hey, do you think this is a normal or abnormal CTPA? They all agreed that this was a, a abnormal finding, but they couldn't identify it prospectively. So when we do a PET VQ scan on the PET scanner as opposed to the specs camera, we get some really beautiful images. And we, when we start showing these images to our clinicians, they find a whole array of new clinical indications that they would like to perform. And unlike probably conventional VQ scanning, which is either static or dying off in many centres, when we can start producing beautiful pictures, uh, which uh, the clinicians believe, uh, they start ordering it uh, with their feet. We can do uh, renal scans on the PET scanner. Uh, this is a gallium EDTA in a patient with obstruction. These are actually the anterior MIP projections. So these are 3D images, but we're just looking at a 2D, so that they look a little bit like conventional nuclear medicine images, but we can normalise them according to an SUV, uh, so we can quantify it very precisely. Uh, we can give fruzamide, and here we can see that the left kidney a tracer accumulates, but when you're given fruzamide, it empties rapidly, whereas on the right kidney, it doesn't respond to fruzamide, so it's obstructed. And we can see the level of obstruction uh, very clearly. We see the ureter uh, stopping here. And when we look at the CT underlying anatomic template, we can identify the precise point and the reason for this obstruction. Uh, and we can do this in three dimensions uh, very beautifully. We can label red cells with gallium-68 and do a conventional cardiac gated blood pool scans, but in three dimensions, and we can acquire this image in under two minutes, uh, which makes the patient experience better rather than sitting on a conventional camera for perhaps 15 minutes to acquire this, we can do it in a much smaller amount of time. Alternatively, we could give a much lower amount of radiation, image them for perhaps five or six minutes, and uh, give uh, do the same study but with lower radiation exposure. In this study, we labelled uh, iron oxide nanoparticles with gallium-68 as a nanocolloid and injected it into patients' prostate at the same time that they were having brachytherapy seeds inserted to look at the lymphatic spread. Uh, and what we could see was that it drained to an inguinal and an internal iliac node, as we expected. But since we could do whole-body rapid imaging on the PET scanner, we could see uptake in the mediastinum, which was quite remarkable given that there wasn't any uptake in between. So we were seeing lymphatic drainage from the pelvis all the way to a supraclavicular node, which was an unusual discovery, but sort of well documented if you go back and look at autopsy literature of prostate cancer. And now that we have gallium PSMA imaging for imaging prostate cancer, we see the same phenomenon. So this is a patient where we can see uptake in very small nodes. These nodes are barely visible on the CT, but have abnormal uptake on the gallium PSMA PET, but here we see a supraclavicular node which was biopsied and shown to be a prostate adenocarcinoma. Uh, we can label new traces with gallium. This is gallium extendant 4 for localising an insulinoma recurrence in a patient where every other imaging modality, including gallium dotatate, uh, was unable to find the tumour in this patient. There's lots of fluorinated traces which are of interest as well. This is fluorothymidine. FLD, FLT is a, a tracer that basically images cellular proliferation and the most proliferating organ in the body is our bone marrow. So this is not metastatic tumour but this is uh, just normal bone marrow and the patient had radiotherapy uh, to some lymph nodes in the neck three weeks prior and you can see that there's no bone marrow in that area because the radiotherapy has wiped it out. And when we look at it in sagittal we can see that quite nicely. When we overlap the radiotherapy treatment field from three weeks prior, we can see how good the FLT is. Uh, within the two to five grey isotope contour of this plan, the marrow has decreased, which is exactly what we expect. But the uh, co-registration of the function to the anatomy is really beautifully uh, demonstrated. And this same patient, the radiation oncologist, then wanted to give radiotherapy to the pelvis to treat this patient, and he was concerned that doing that would be too dangerous to the patient, that they would lose too much normal bone marrow in that process. So we were able to overlay the normal uh, or the anticipated 
uh, plan, do a simple calculation and tell the radiation oncologist that if you proceed with this, we will ablate 22% of this patient's bone marrow. And uh, the radiation oncologist was then able to decide what to do. So if we think about where we're going with PET, I think we have to pause for a minute and think about where we're going with, uh, with medicine, because medicine is uh, rapidly changing. And I do like this tweet by Eric Topol, uh, who kind of says, old medicine is population-based, new medicine is individualised, old medicine doctor-ordered data, now patient-generated data, doctor's notes that are unshared, our notes that are patient-edited, so we need to think about this, uh, information owned by doctors and hospitals, information owned by the rightful owner, which is the patient. So in the future, as we do imaging such as PET scans, the reports will perhaps have to go out to the patients as well. The images will need to be accessible by the patient that may look at the images as well and uh, perhaps even contribute to some of their analysis. Uh, I've added one on the bottom uh, to, to this tweet, which was doctor interpretation to computer-assisted or artificial intelligence. Uh, because I think computers can do what we humans do in some areas much better. So this is an FDG PET scan, and we look at it and we can see that there's extensive bony metastases and extensive liver metastases, and we can give a visual report, and that's what we do on a daily basis. But we miss so much information that's in this scan uh, that perhaps a computer could uh, do much better than we can. So I was playing with this on our Invista software last week. I was able to segment out all the tumour very quickly by asking the computer to highlight anything with an SUV over uh, liver plus two standard deviations and then subtract the normal organs like the brain and the heart. I can segment out the skeleton on the CT very easily by just saying, give me anything with a Hounsfeld unit over 200. I can then get the computer to take the union of these two and that will give me the metastases that are confined to bone. I can segment out the liver very easily on the CT and say, show me just the tumour that's in liver, segment out the lungs and tumour that's in lung. And very quickly, the computer can do automated tumour segmentation. It can tell me that there's so much volume of tumour within liver and bone and lung. We could perhaps interrogate this further and the computer could give us the normal volume of liver, how much tumour is in the liver. It could tell us a statistic. 66% of the tumour is involved with liver in the liver. There's 28 lesions. It involves all segments. The largest one is 4.5 centimetres. It takes a lot of time to do this manually, and we just don't offer this to our referrers. Uh, but I think the imaging report of the future may have more advanced automatic segmentation where a computer extracts all this data and we can give this referrer uh, more information. We also want to know in more detail than simply an SUV max. So we can see that in the bone, the SUVs is very different than the SUVs in the liver in this tumour. And this may be telling us something about the fundamental metabolism of tumour in different organs being different. And that will give us some insights. We can also segment out the normal organs fairly easily. Lung, heart, liver, spleen, kidney, uh, the bone from the CT component and then get a variety of different statistics. So I'd like some software that does this, looks at the anatomy and the PET component and scores everything for us. We can visually see that this brain is hypo has hypometabolism, but it would be great if a computer compared it to a normal database and showed that to me so that I didn't miss it. The computer can look at the lungs and identify nodules, I'm sure, much better than a human can. Tell me that there's three nodules on the CT, three nodules on the the PET component, can tell me that the liver's moderately enlarged compared to a normal database and filled with tumour, can tell me that the kidneys in this patient are small and analyse it very uh, well. Now I can tell you this patient actually has metastatic prostate adenocarcinoma and we were thinking about treating them with radio-labelled PSMA. So we went on and did a gallium PSMA PET scan and when we look at the two scans side by side, uh, we can see that there's uptake in the bony metastases in the PSMA and on the FDG, but within the liver, there seems to be a bit of discordance. And we can make this more clear to our referrers and also to our patients if we segment out the tumours on both scans and then perhaps combine them into one scan so that we don't have to look at two data sets, which can be confusing. And here we can see the FDG and PSMA have a disease 
in a single scan and it becomes obvious to us that PSMA therapy is not a good choice in this patient since we can only target a proportion of the disease. We can get the computer to crunch the numbers and you can see in red is the disease that we can't target and we can only target about a less than a fifth of the disease in this patient. Not a sensible thing to do. So the cancer imaging paradigm is really changing. The conventional anatomic tumor nodal metastasis staging really involved looking at a CT scan, measuring lumps, counting them, a very sort of simplistic approach. You would then start a treatment, perhaps wait several months since tumors take some time to shrink after you start a treatment and repeat the scan. The molecular imaging paradigm is using uh, PET imaging to define prognosis, to identify targets that will predict whether a therapy that you're about to embark on will work and look at other things like tumor heterogeneity. And then once you start a treatment, you don't want to wait three months, six months. You want to perhaps give one treatment, one cycle of treatment, and then repeat the PET scan to see whether the patient's responding so that you don't waste time and money giving a futile therapy, don't waste the side effects of a futile therapy. And we can look at a variety of different uh, targets to do this, and we don't have time to touch on them all today. So it's a fairly simple uh, idea that you use the PET to identify a predictive marker. In that scan, you saw a PSMA PET to do that. Uh, then you would select the therapy if, and then give one or two cycles of the therapy. If the patient's responding, continue the therapy. If no, uh, give something else. So one of the oldest therapies we have is radioactive iodine. You're going to hear about more about theranostics this afternoon. Uh, is this patient suitable for radioiodine therapy? We can see a whole... Uh, uh, bunch of tumours within bone lighting up in this patient. Who thinks this patient looks like they're suitable for radioactive iodine? Rod thinks the patient's uh, suitable. I thought he would have asked for an FDG PET scan. Uh, <laughs> and, and this is where things get a little bit more complicated. So we want to know that we can target all the sites of tumour in this patient. And when we do the FDG PET, we see that there's perhaps more tumour, which isn't iodine avid in this patient. We can uh, get the computer to segment out all the iodine avid disease, all the FDG avid disease. And again, we can see that about a third of the tumour in this patient, like this bony metastasis here, which has absolutely no iodine uptake, cannot be targeted. And we can predict that uh, in advance. And I think we still went on to give this patient radioactive iodine since we could target two-thirds of their disease and they had pain. And then we gave them radio external beam radiotherapy uh, to this site as a palliative treatment. And whilst we've been doing this with the theranostic treatments that we do for a long time now, our oncology colleagues largely have still not woken up to this approach. And uh, that's a bit of a shame. And I think in the future, hopefully, all of oncology will move in this direction. So this is a patient with metastatic breast cancer, uh, not from our centre. We can see the FDG PET with liver and uh, pulmonary metastases. And this was a zirconium uh, HER2 uh, labelled antibody PET scan. And we can see that the tumours in the liver light up brightly, but the ones in the lung less. And in this study, this was a prospective study, they categorised patients into four groups based on performing an FDG and a HER2 PET, that the entire tumour load was HER2 positive, that the dominant part was HER2 positive, a minor part was HER2 positive, or none of the disease was HER2 positive. And then they looked prospectively at the outcomes in this patient, and they were able to show that the PET was predictive of outcome. Uh, so if you, were, if you could target all the sites of disease, if all your disease was HER2 positive, then you did very well. And if uh, none of your disease was HER2 positive, uh, then all the patients uh, failed. So we can really do better than histopathology with a PET scan because we can image the whole body and decide on every tumour lesion uh, rather than histopathology where you're confined to biopsying a single site. And in the last couple minutes of the talk, I'm just going to move away from the PET scanning part of it to everything that comes before we actually scan the patient, uh, which is the equipment and the radiopharmaceuticals. So the underpinning of conventional nuclear medicine has really been using technetium 99M with cold kits, and that's been a very convenient, simple, uh, quick way to produce radiopharmaceuticals. Uh, we can do it in a sterile fashion. Uh, the regulatory authorities be, have been happy with this approach. Uh, but we can now do this with gallium-68 as well. So it's potential to do this for 
Uh, all those gallium isotopes that you saw earlier in the presentation can be done in theory with uh, cold kits. So it should be widely dispersible. And if we want to think about more complicated labelling like fluorinated traces uh, or perhaps some antibody labelling, perhaps not so simple, uh, but maybe in the future we'll have machines that can do this. Uh, so this is uh, one of Rod's ideas that I've uh, put into a slide, which is like you make your Nespresso coffee. One of the advantages of the Nespresso machine is you can choose what type of coffee you want. One time you want decaffeinated, one time you want uh, a strong coffee. Uh, perhaps we can have a variety of different capsules for different traces, and you would just uh, pop it into a machine, uh, press a button, and out would come a tracer that you then uh, inject into a, a patient. And this is not as fanciful as it seems because people are now making these devices. There's an area of radiochemistry called microfluidics, and this is one such device uh, where you literally take a cartridge, uh, put it in this device, and via a very sort of uh, simple mechanism with the tracer flowing uh, through a series of tubes, uh, it radiolabels. And in this study, they were able to do a 14-minute FDG uh, production with a very high uh, labelling efficiency. The best way to predict the future is to create it. I think this is something that uh, Rod has done extremely uh, well in his career. He thinks of a great idea, then he does it, and it uh, uh, sometimes becomes the standard of care a decade later. Uh, I quite like the look of uh, this device, uh, which is a full-body PET scanner, where you go in the PET scanner and you acquire the whole body in one sitting since the crystals are covering the whole body. Uh, this would give you 40 times the sensitivity. Uh, you could either do a whole body PET scan in 30 seconds or one minute, or you could lower the radiation dose and put them in the scanner for four or five minutes. You could look at whole body three-dimensional organ kinetics. Uh, if you thought about pediatric indications, you could put a child in the scanner and probably get away without needing an any anaesthesia. And there's a whole variety of... Uh, uh, potential indications. And I think if I think towards the future, uh, maybe in five or ten years we'll have uh, one of these devices in our centre and PET scanning will become an extremely uh, fast uh, way to do true uh, whole body imaging. So this is my uh, last slide, which is the, the best radio tracer to date. There is a standout tracer that has the highest uh, tumour to background contrast uh, in oncology. Can someone nominate the, the best tracer to date? Richard Walser's radioactive iodine is, uh, and this is uh, such a scan, and it's not the it's not the prettiest scan because we can't see the patient outline, and that's because there's almost no background. Uh, this is a this is a PET scan, and I put a contour on blue based on the CT scan, you can see that this was quite a large patient. And it's such a good scan because the tumour's lighting up, but you can't see any background. And let's take a slice through this. There are some uh, mediastinal nodes lighting up extremely brightly on this PET scan. And when we look at the CT scan, there's almost no abnormality. I'll show you the arrow. It's probably about a one millimetre uh, mediastinal node. But when you look at the PET scan, the uptake is extraordinary. In fact, the SUV max of this uh, is 430, and Richard Wall's correct, this, uh, this is radioactive iodine, but with I-124. Uh, so this is not a new tracer. Uh, this tracer was de really developed in the 1930s and 40s. Uh, so we need more tracers like radioactive iodine that have a very high uptake uh, with low background. Uh, uh, this, now we can do this with a positron-emitting isotope rather than SPECT and get even... Uh, faster acquisitions and prettier pictures. But a lot of what we are uh, creating now in the future are really uh, just recycling good ideas from the past. So thank you very much. And